the pain that I felt was not something you can put a Band-Aid on it. And I remember looking back and it had been five, six years since I had seen my kids. When I um, entered that place, completely turned dark. Cried out to a God that I wasn't sure existed. You dive into more pain, you dive into more destruction. And I was more broken and more lost than I'd ever been in my life. There was always confusion and chaos and something, uh, there was always a deep hole, a missing part in my life that created me to really search and seek. Mom and my dad's marriage was, their relationship was falling apart. When I was 15, they divorced. The distance between my parents um, created distance between my parents and myself. And so how am I gonna deal with this pain? I can't talk to anybody about it. Alcohol was a, a place in my life. The first time, I remember the first time I drank alcohol was at a friend's house. Like I felt free in that moment. Like I didn't feel any pain. I didn't feel any anxiety. It was like freedom. It goes from alcohol to ecstasy to marijuana to cocaine and, and then all of them together and LSD and all different types of drugs. This small hole that I was able to fill um, with the drugs and alcohol and I was able to maintain and, and go through school and things like that. Um, but after the death of my father, it became like the bottom fell out, like the worthlessness I felt and the pain that I felt was not something you can put a Band-Aid on. It. Shortly after, two weeks after, actually, I turned 18, um, I walked into my first gentleman's club here in Houston. I would, you know, I would stop at nothing to um, mask or cover up the pain of what I was feeling. And what's so, what's so weird is that you dive into more pain, you dive into more destruction. Grew up in Southern California. My mom and dad were both Los Angeles police officers. When I was 14 is when my father died. From that point on, I had a little less um, authority and supervision in my life and uh, started kind of going off uh, with the wrong crowd. And uh, I was really actively involved in different drug activity and criminal activity. And I dropped out of school, um, ended up working construction industry. And, uh, you know, it was just a group of guys that worked hard and partied hard and that was the, the kind of the cycle I got caught up in. Moved in with a girlfriend, started a family, and I remember thinking that somehow um, having kids and being a dad and all those kind of things was going to automatically make me be more responsible. My drug addiction and my drinking and my partying got even crazier and uh, my responsibilities continued to increase. So. Uh, 12 years down the line, we've got four kids. Um, I'm deep in my addiction, crazy lifestyle, uh, and uh, the mother of my kids took the kids and basically fled, moved away, and uh, got away from me. I, uh, I met this woman who, um, she basically had an agenda of her own and said that if I can get her to uh, Palestine, Texas, she would help me get off of drugs and alcohol and help me get a job. Uh, the next day I got a day labor job working for a roofing contractor in San Bernardino, California. And um, I took the man's truck and all of his tools and I picked up my girlfriend and we headed to Texas. Uh, I got to Palestine, Texas, got rid of the stolen vehicle, was committed to turning my life around and for about three months life was going real well. Uh, I met somebody who was a drug addict like I was and recognized him right away and just realized that uh, he would have access to drugs just based on how he looked and how he talked and how he walked and turns out he was a, a crystal meth cook and me and him became very good friends and I began getting involved in manufacturing crystal meth. Drinking until I could not drink anymore, doing 
massive amounts of cocaine so I could actually drive home. I was surviving each day, you know, driving home in a blackout. I'd wake up the next morning and I survived. And I would say, okay, well then I guess I could do this again. I was dating a man, I was living with a man, and um, I became pregnant. Um, probably about um, 11 months after she was born, her father left. I found myself raising um, my daughter by myself. And I had no idea how I was going to provide. And so um, probably when Trinity was about 18 months old, I, I went back into the gentlemen's clubs in Houston. There's always been this longing of wanting to be whole. Um, whatever that looked like, whatever I could, uh, you know, whatever I could fit into my, my mind to distract me, whatever I could fit into my heart that I felt a moment of happiness. Um, whether it was a person, whether it was a drug, whether it was anything, it was like, that's what I thought. I just didn't find the right fit yet, is what I was searching for. My body was shutting down. Um, the alcohol and the drugs had just totally consumed um, what was left of my health. This day was different. This day was, this was a day that forever changed my life. And so, um, I went and picked up my daughter from school and I felt very faint, very lightheaded. Um, I wasn't able to eat or drink anything. I drove myself to the emergency room and I um, just proceeded to again lie and tell them that um, I didn't know what was wrong with me, I, you know, I can't keep any food down and I feel dehydrated and lightheaded and, and I just, I kept praying, God don't let me, don't let me die. So when the doctor came in, he um, proceeded to tell me that um, the results of my blood work, um, he said that, uh, Miss Gray, he said that everything, you were perfectly fine. Those words just hit my ears and it wasn't, how do you process that you're perfectly fine when you know, by with a shadow of a doubt, you're not perfectly fine? I deserve to hear you have cancer, I deserve to hear you, you're dying. You know, that's what I, that's what I was ready, I, I braced myself for. After those words being spoken over me and to me, when he put the blanket on me was when, um, I mean, I can't, it's hard for me to describe the presence of God. I can't, there aren't words in my vocabulary to even explain um, what it feels like to be invaded fully by the Holy Spirit and power of God. Not just like lifting out of you the desire to drink or use or inflict pain on yourself, but for him to go and, and totally transform my heart. Like take out that hardness, which was like shame and guilt and disgust with myself and, and the burden of all of what I've been carrying in my life, to have that removed. You can't, you can't explain it. It's a love that um, I've been searching for. I was finally um, made whole that day, that moment. I heard him call me daughter. I had more money and more drugs than I'd ever had in my life and I was more broken and more lost than I'd ever been in my life. And I remember looking back and it had been five, six years since I had seen my kids. It was in that season of my life that uh, I cried out to the Lord, um, cried out to a God that I wasn't sure existed and just saying, you know what, if there's really a God, then you didn't create me to be doing what I'm doing. Because I looked around and I started noticing that everybody whose lives I was involved with they were much worse off after they met me than they were when they met me. 
me and the drugs that I was producing was the root of a lot of people's problems. And, and I didn't really like the way that made me feel. And I knew that the Lord did not create me to do that. What I found in that situation was that when you cry out to God for the very first time, He shows up. On February the 1st, 2003, uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia blew up over Dallas, Texas, and the debris field from the Space Shuttle Columbia fell into the woods, starting from Palestine, Texas, all the way to Nacogdoches. And these happens to be the same woods where uh, me and my friends were cooking a lot of crystal meth. And in the weeks that followed, they launched the largest ground search effort ever in the history of aviation uh, in Palestine, Texas, where uh, in their search for space shuttle debris, they found meth lab after meth lab in those woods and launched a drug task force. Uh, March the 29th, 2004, um, I, had, uh, I had just the day before gotten away from a house that they raided where I was living. And uh, all of my friends and uh, my, my girlfriend, her sister, and all their kids all went to jail that day and I got away. And uh, I went to uh, a friend of mine's house and spent the night and my plan was to get up the next morning and go back to California. And um, I fell asleep in that house that night. When I woke up in the morning, the house was full of cops and they were going room to room searching for me. And I crawled off of that bed and I curled up under a pile of dirty clothes. And uh, for the second time in my life, I cried out to God and I said, Lord, please get me out of this. Um, I'll stop doing drugs forever. I just, I don't want to party anymore. I don't want to be part of this lifestyle anymore. I just want out of this situation. And um, not in an audible voice, but in a way that I understood in my heart, um, the Lord spoke to me and said that he was getting me out of the situation. But it wasn't the way I wanted to get out of the situation. It was the way he needed to get me out of the situation. And uh, a couple minutes later, I heard a cop come into the room and he got on the walkie-talkie and he said that um, they've searched the whole house and that there was no one there. And another cop responded over the walkie-talkie and said they were sending in a canine unit. And so uh, when I was 37 years old, I went to jail that day, um, uh, ended up getting a 10-year prison sentence and spent the next three years in prison. That was on March the 29th, 2004. That was my first day clean and sober. Um, that was the end of a, a long run of drug addiction and, and crazy living um, for all of my adult life up until that point. During that time, I had a clear understanding that the Lord had responded to my cry to take me out of the life I had been living. When I cried out to God that very first time, that He forgave me for everything I had ever done in that instant. And that in that instant, He gave me a new identity. That Jesus, He came to set me free. He came and He died that I may live. I've been completely changed. I can tell my story and I can, you know, share what God has done in my life because He's freed me from that shame. How do you not tell people about that? And so when I got out of prison, I ended up paroling to Houston, Texas, where I didn't know a soul. And uh, I paroled to a place called the Open Door Mission where I lived for about three months. And during that time, they referred me to an organization called the Work Faith Connection, where I went to be prepared to uh, help market, you know, just to help people that have uh, trouble in their past market themselves to employers and uh, help them become employable. They actually offered me a job there um, to help other people that were in the same season of their lives that were coming out of prison, transitioning out of homelessness, or overcoming drug addiction. April 26th of 2013, I met. Um, Scott Wesley, who is a um, who is the grant writer there at Work Faith Connection, that was just excited to meet her and to know her. And as we began talking, um, she revealed to me that in 2007 she got clean and sober, and in 2007 she got saved. And in 2007 the Lord began to do a work in her. And that was right at the season of my life where I was asking the Lord to give me a godly woman. The Holy Spirit just filled. Um, our hearts with this like safety and we just immediately began to share each other's testimonies like back and forth. Scott, you are the reminder to me of God's faithfulness, His redemptive love, His reconciling grace, and His purposes and promises being fulfilled in my life. 
I vow to cherish that every moment. Let the Lord deal ever so very severe with me if anything but death separates you and me. I am committed to you on every level. I am going to lead you well, and I am going to cover you when I need to cover you, and I am going to be the husband that Christ created me to be. I'm just, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, I'm so looking forward to spending the rest of my life with you. You are a wonderful woman, and I just could not be more blessed in this moment. <laughs> Scott, you may kiss your breath. first time, Mr. and Mrs. Scott and Jessica Wesley. Every little piece of this story has just increased my understanding that God has a plan for me and that He loves me.